Hello and welcome to this analysis. Uh, first, in what I intend to be a five part series looking at Ford Maddox Ford's Parade's End, a modernist novel written in the 1920s, reflecting on the high society in Britain just before and during the war. And I'll also be looking at it with the aid of the Tom Stoppard script of the 2012 television adaptation uh, co-produced by BBC and HBO, starring Benedict Cumberbatch as the main character of the novel one Christopher Tegens. So the five parts I intend to do should more or less mirror the five episodes of the miniseries, uh, because the modernist novel, I suppose we'll get into this now, the structure of the modernist novel is such that many of the scenes happen as personal reflections and memories. So the chronological appearance of the, the television series isn't necessarily how you see it in the book. I'll try and go how the television series did it, but I will have references to the key scenes uh, that are played out as they happen in the book. So we look at certain paragraphs of Ford's description because at the end of so though Stoppard arranged it in a script-like fashion, it's Ford's novel that is the essence of the beauty of what he's going for, what he's telling here at the end of England. And the end of England is a theme that is running throughout. Tegens, Christopher Tegens, the main character, embodies this. Uh, his Protestantism coming from Netherlands over with King William. Basically, he traces his family tree back to there. And so he obtains the Protestant ideal, stiff upper lip, the English country gentleman, despite the fact even before the war, there is a certain level and level of decadence in the society, which is proven to unravel the, the fabric of the hierarchical order that the British world has created. The main part of this damaging effect, even before the war, is through his marriage. And sex and marital affairs are seen to be almost always damaging or disastrous, particularly to Tegens, but we see it in other characters. His friend McMaster has his own affairs and so on. Tegens then will also be a more complex man than just this uh, sort of reactionary dreaming of the 18th century at the beginning of the 20th. He's sort of the overworking hysterical brain and the underworkings of the damaged brain will come in later after his war experience. So you see these, he's entering modernity in a sense. He's clever enough to deal with it, but he has the morality trappings not to deal with it or the inability to deal with it because of his sense of, of 18th century morality, his reactionary tendencies. Now, the book itself has four parts. Part one, some do not. Uh, sorry, the book itself was, Parade's End was actually four separate novels published in four separate periods throughout the 1920s. The first uh, book is called Some Do Not, and it's broken into two parts. And those two parts roughly resemble the actually the first three episodes of Stoppard's Parade's End. So Stoppard takes most of his material from the first of four books. The second book is then No More Parades. That's Tegens at war, but not at the front line. Um, in the when he is helping arrange uh, prepare preparation of the troops to be sent out to the front line. And we'll see that in episode four. And then uh, episode five will be equivalent to book three, which is called A Man Could Stand Up. That's Tijin's front line experience. The fourth book that Ford released was called The Last Post. And in it, Tijin's rarely appears. Uh, it's, it's sort of seen as an addendum to the others. And what Stopper did when he's given the job of turning the modernist novel into script 
is that he takes elements from the last post that he likes and puts them in at the end of episode five. So that's the structure. And today, what I want to talk about in episode one is this general introduction, a setting of what I'm going to go for throughout the, the five part analysis. And I'll also mainly be talking about book one, some do not, and part one of that book, which contains some seven chapters. In book one, part one, which largely corresponds to episode one, we see three key scenes and a fourth sort of scene through a different lens. So three key Christopher Tejan scenes and one more in the line of his partner, Sylvia Tejan's nay Satterthwaite, uh, in which she's in Germany, having eloped. The three key Tejan scenes, though, are the golf course, the, the excursion of the golf course and the clash with the suffragettes, breakfast at Duchemin's, where the Reverend Duchemin, now in a, in a degraded state, has to host this awkward breakfast. We get to see many of the characters interacting in an interior setting. And then we finally have the personal trip between Valentine Wanup and Christopher Tejans, where Wanup will begin to expose herself to Tejans as a more idyllic female counterpart than his quote, whore of a wife, close quote, Sylvia Tejans. And, and that appeal of Valentine as a pure beauty, then Sylvia will begin to unfold in Tejan's eyes. And that's done in, as they go through the, the Sussex countryside. So you've got golf course, breakfast at Dushman's, and then the, the Sussex excursion, where it's simply the two of those characters until uh, they're stumbled upon by General Campion and his men. The opening scenes of episode one are to kind of set everything up so that we get to the golf course. So we get to the first scene where you can see the relief from Stoppard when he gets to this tangential scene. He set up the characters, right? Christopher has married Sylvia. It's kind of been foisted upon them. There was an episode where she is on the train and Christopher in a moment of weakness falls for her. She then it becomes pregnant, and it's unclear if this is through that moment in the train with Christopher in a sort of secluded carriage. You have to picture the old style carriage, or if it's from a previous relationship Sylvia had uh, with a man called Gerald Drake, who, if you were watching along episode one, you see bursting in in the very first scene with T uh, with Sylvia the night before she is married to Christopher. It's her desperate attempt to to stop to stop the marriage. This sets up this internal doubt in Tejans' mind throughout the entire work about whether the son is his. Um, the son, of course, is the future heir to Groby. This will become obvious when Tej we learn that Tejans' elder brother, Mark, will have no heir, no issue. So the, the son and the doubt of whose son he is is going to be symbolic of the uncertain future of England and the particularly the aristocratic classes. So the opening scene, Stoppard is trying to set up all these things which actually occur in the in the novel as internal uh, monologues or internal thoughts or remembrances of past scenes until he gets to that golf scene. And then he can begin to show the audience the memorable parts as they play out more naturally. And, and this can put a few people off the HBO BBC adaptation because the first few scenes are seen to maybe rush a little bit towards that. It's difficult to know where you would start with it, but you have to have something to establish the characters slightly before the golf scene or else I think people would be too lost and the impact of the golf scene would fall flat on an audience. And there are some good scenes there. You have the piece where uh, Tejans is reading and making corrections to the Encyclopedic, uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica which shows Sylvia's frustration at him. He's almost at an intellectual ability above and beyond her. She's lost. She has no grip on the Tejan's personality, even though she's used to pulling and haranguing men for her own personal satisfaction, sort of uh, putting them in awkward spots for her own amusement. 
she struggles with Christopher. Uh, he is, through his reactionary tendencies, becomes something obscure to her. She's used to the man who's ready to fall over her, the modern man, the Tory of the pig's trough, as Christopher Teachings will later call them. So, and again, if, if I say at any point Teachings, I'm referring to Christopher Teachings. If I refer to his brother, I will explicitly say I'm referring to Mark. The son is called Michael, though in the book there's this debate of whether he is called Mark or Michael. There's the whole thing about whether he should be baptised in the Anglican faith or the, or, or the Catholic faith that should be brought up in the Anglican or Catholic faith because Sylvia, nay, Satterthwaite, is uh, from an aristocratic family that stayed Catholic. And that's going to be another piece, another layer of British society examined by Ford. The fact Satterthwaite's were Catholic and they're marrying into the most saintly Anglican uh, vision which is Christopher. So that's Christopher's personal life. What about his professional life? Well, Stoppard also needs to set you up with where he is professionally before he gets to that golf scene. Christopher and, Mac and his friend McMaster, who he's helped build through a, an old friendship from obscurity in Scotland, this is McMaster's background, work in the newly formed Imperial Department of Statistics, which is meant to be uh, emblematic of uh, a, an obscure imperial department that actually runs the world, as Ford puts it. And when Ford introduces you in his first chapter to these two characters, uh, Christopher Tejans and Vincent McMaster, they're on the train heading to the Sussex Golf Club. And this, the imperial department of statistics, their profession is meant to be that, just that thing that appeals to Christopher's intellect statistical and with the ability to calculate and determine in an impartial way but of course immediately we see his professional life is actually plagued by politics he's told to uh, make the numbers work so that they fit the agenda of a liberal minister uh, one named waterhouse so christopher's personal life is full of doubt he doesn't know whether his son is his own whether his son will be reared as a Catholic or as a Protestant, and his personal life is tormented by politics. He, his vision of England uh, and, and the world is one of order and calm deliberation and then inaction of set goals that work under some guise of tradition by the actions of the liberal minister Waterhouse trying to force numbers. Uh, the numbers themselves are to back up a bill which has to do with welfare. So again, undercutting Tejans's noblesse oblige reactionary beliefs, but also his professional life, even if he says, okay, well, the noblesse oblige is falling apart, but the Imperial Department of S Statistics and the Englishmen that run the world through it can still do good work no that's hindered as well by people like waterhouse and so all of this is getting established before the first critical golf scene thank you sir which is that if they don't get what they require from you they'll put some competition one head clerk on it and take our credit from us i simply wish you to be aware of the facts there's no difficulty in adjusting the calculations to produce a more congenial result I can let McMaster have it in the hour and ten minutes remaining, but I insist on his taking the credit for it. Good man. But let's have a look at how Ford introduces the characters of Christopher Teachings and Vincent McMaster on their train to that golf scene. Here are the opening paragraphs of Parade's End. The two young men, they were of the English public official class, sat in the perfectly appointed railway carriage. The leather straps to the windows were of virgin newness, the mirrors beneath the new luggage racks immaculate as if they had reflected very little. The bulging upholstery in its luxuriant regulated curves was scarlet and yellow in an intricate, minute dragon pattern, the design of a geometrician in Cologne. The compartment smelled faintly, hygienically, of admirable varnish. The train ran as smoothly 
Tijin's remembered thinking as British gilt-edged securities. It travelled fast. Yet it had swayed or jolted over the rail joints except the curve before Tonbridge or over the points at Ashford, where these eccentricities are expected and allowed for. McMaster, Tijin's felt certain, would have written to the company. Perhaps he would have even written to the Times. Their class administered the world, not merely the newly created Imperial Department of Statistics under Sir Reginald Ingleby. If they saw policemen misbehave, railway porters lack civility, an insufficiency of street lamps, defects in public services, or in foreign countries, they saw to it, either with nonchalant Balliol voices or with letters to the Times asking in regretful indignation, has the British this or that come to this? And that gives you a sense of what the what Tijins' vision of the Imperial Department of Statistics is at the outset. By the time we get to the golf scene as well, Sylvia has eloped with this sort of bumbling fool, uh, the complete opposite of Tijins, one uh, Potty Perone. And Tijins is left thinking about whether or not he should divorce. Of course, his instincts are not to divorce. He says he believes in monogamy and chastity and uh, not talking about it in an old, his idea of the old British class sense. But there's flaws in, in Tijin's re, uh, reactionary tendencies, which, which, we'll, which we'll see. I mean, his vision of the 18th century is far too pure. In fact, it's almost uh, a Victorian morality back propagated onto his vision of an ancien regime in the 18th century but for now it's his belief and he will not the fort but let's look for a second at this train carriage that fort puts us in where tijins and mcmaster are traveling to the golf club for mcmaster you already said he came from nothing he befriended tijins and tijins lifted up his career McMaster is going to be symbolic of the self-made man, the rising middle, uh, which, though Tijins is friendly with him, on a more larger scale, threatens Tijins' view. Um, though it's done quite well in the book, neither are ever antagonists. They do remain friends. They, uh, there's a certain loyalty between them. Again, that's the personal juxtaposed against what they represent on a larger scale, where they are at odds. And the opening pages of Ford's book are all about painting Christopher Tijins as the reactionary heir to Groby, believer that all has gone to hell in a handbasket for Britain, against McMaster, who sees the Imperial Department of Statistics as a mechanism through which he can rise through society. And this is, uh, will also be shown in the tastes of McMaster. He's into the Rossettis. He's into his own sort of vision of, of, of what bohemian 19th century writers and thinkers represented to him now in uh, Britain in 1911, which is the year of the Gulf scene. And what Ford, I think, is getting at is he's trying to tell you that these two in the one carriage hurtling along towards their fates were those that together administered the world in 1911. Uh, one was already fading, the other was already riding. The signs were there and the Great War is going to come in as, although in a, in a cataclysmic way, not as a bolt from the blue, not as something which, uh, like a meteorite hitting British society. The destabilizing factors um, Will, will already have been present in 1911. I mean, there's small differences between these two characters. Ford points out in his opening uh, scene of them that, for instance, Tijins is immaculately well-dressed in, in his own manner. He looks like a uh, landed aristocracy, but he doesn't remember what color tie he has on him. McMaster remembers every detail of what he has on him. Uh, the the The... Stoppard adaptation gives a nod to this when you see McMaster planning on the train journey whether he'll 
have changed into his his Lynx, his golf uh, attire on the train, but then he decides not to because he may bump into certain important characters on the train. And again, he's always trying to move up, always trying to insert himself into the conversations of those above him and into the presence of those above him as a showcase of of that of himself as a rising man. So he decides to wear his clothes a certain way. Tijins doesn't even need to think about it. In some ways, it's because Tijins' ability of the... Uh, Tijins' landed aristocracy makes it so that there is a natural ability for him to be appropriately dressed or, or doing the appropriate manners. Everything for McMaster is, an, is a concentrated effort uh, of presentation. But for Tijins, it comes naturally. And so that's an interesting thing you have to undertake you have to you can see between these two men Tijins and McMaster McMaster will ultimately despite his own pursuits of rising always be defined in relation to those around him Tijins not so Tijins is his own man and much more in a sense the great man um, not in a Carlalian sense of greatness but in what Ford Maddox Ford will show throughout the novel that he's trying to get through the vision of the Anglican saint. So it's a sainthood in its own sense. And because it's a sainthood, Tijins is his own man and does not react to the world around him in the same way that McMaster is. Tijins has created his own vision of, of who he wants to be in the world and then will behave accordingly. And all of this, of course, is its, is its own parade for Tijins. And that's going to be a part of the book that the pressure put on him professionally personally and then of course finally um just on a on a basic mental level by the the stress of the war is going to break down this parade for teachings but it's interesting that mcmaster will not find satisfaction he will permanently be defined by those around him and here is uh here's ford on mcmaster his intimacy with teachings permitted him to be rather on the born side of the institution his agreeableness, he knew he was agreeable and useful, to Sir Reginald Ignalby, protecting him in the main from unpleasantness. So it's always there, conscious in the mind of McMaster, that he becomes on the born side of the institution, i.e. with the landed aristocracy, because of teachings. There's also a sense when Ford gives McMaster his literary side, you know, he's, he has a monograph on the Rossettis coming in, yeah, he wants to write about Dante Gabriel Rossetti. He's falling in love with a woman, Mrs. Dushman. Again, that's going to be critical scene number two, Breakfast at Dushman's, uh, who is representative of a pre-Raphaelite nostalgia. That Ford is writing about what he knew, the literary world. Okay, how much does Ford really know about an imperial department of statistics? He wants to write about it in the fact that there's a, there's a cold, crisp, calculating administrative task to it. But... He also wants to put in a flourish of the artistic in here. And that's why he gives it to McMaster, whether it's realistic that such a character would have both sides to him. Uh, it's dubious, but we'll, we'll allow it. And, and what it does is it gives Ford much greater grasp of what he's writing when, when he's talking about the artistic history and, and its relation to McMaster's impression of, of the pre-Raphaelites. And of course, Tijans refers to all of this side of McMaster as his pre-Raphaelite horrors. Um, uh, that's those are Ford's words. Stoppard gives his own words, where he he talks about it, uh, a Rossetti poem resembling congealed bacon fat. And this, I mean, this is Tijans' view on page eighteen of Parades End. Uh, if you're using the Penguin uh, publication. I don't read novels, Teachings answered. This is in his debate with McMaster around the pre-Raphaelites. I know what's in them. There has been nothing worth reading written in England since the 18th century, except by a woman, but it's natural for your enamel splashers to want to see themselves in a bright, variegated literature. This is where his vision of England slightly at odds. I mean, what exactly is his view of the 18th century novel? Uh, Richardson? Uh, He's just bypassing, you know, Dickens is useless to him uh, most of the 19th century, Matthew Arnold, anything 
or anything by Trollope. These are nothing to him, but somehow Richardson is amazing. I mean, this is an inconsistency, really. With it. You can understand why he's against the Raphaelites, but to disregard the entire 19th century and head back to Richardson or, uh, you know, a Tom Jones-style novel shows that there's obstinacy beyond truth-telling. And, that, and then that, that, that jars with his own sense of you know, being the, the great statistician. And so really we get to the the golf scene. And bef- before we're brought to the golf scene, there is a chapter where they're at the golf club. They enter an interior room, Tijans and McMaster. And Tijans, Tijans is abhorred with these little pastiches of the, the interior design, whereas McMaster is in love with it. Again, this is a reflection of McMaster liking the pre-Raphaelites, liking this nostalgic sense of imitation. Tijans knowing more of the pure at least in his own mind. Tijans, who hated these disinterred and waxed relics of the past, here talking about the interior rooms of the golf club, sat in the centre of the room at a flimsy card table, beneath a white-shaded electric light of a brilliance that in the surroundings appeared unreasonable. For this was one of those restored old groups of cottages that it was, at that date, the fashion to convert into hostelries. Apologies, not the golf club itself, but where they are staying near the golf club. To it, McMaster was in search of the inspiration of the past, had preferred to come. McMaster, on the other hand, was gratification and a serious air, would run his fingertips along the beveling, bevelings of a dark piece of furniture and would declare it with genuine Chippendale or Jacobean oak, as the case might be. But Teachings was declared that you could tell the beastly thing was a fake by just cocking an eye at it. Teachings does have more of the right of it, though, in this affair. And there's this whole point where Teachings is usually uh, right where McMaster isn't. And this is one of the reasons why Tijans indulges him with the with golf, because it's one of the outlets through which McMaster knows he is genuinely uh, better than Tijans. And so they're playing the on the golf course, and of course there's the, the suffragette disturbance, because in front of them is Waterhouse, the, the Liberal minister who they're targeting. The Liberal cabinet at this point, of course, was anti-suffragette. It was not passing the votes for women. And so Waterhouse is symbolic, really, of the whole the whole pre-war cabinet. And really, the, the golf scene is a place where Ford can make Valentine Wannup, at this point, suffragette and a sort of idealistic believer in, in the progress march of Britain and the world. I mean, that will be ruptured itself by her experiences of the war. But at this moment, you know, she believes that her, the vision of progress is that the women should have the vote, but of course, still under the guise, the writer questions of Britain's imperial sense and the Pax Britannica doesn't come into it. You know, this is this is sort of as if they run the world, Teachings and McMaster, and now that running of the world will be widened uh, so that there'll be votes for women. That's the one-up view. But of course, Teachings will know that the, the system is far less stable to, to, to be able to to be able to deal with that rupture, you know, it, 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 the whole enterprise of empire is actually threatened by by this home front, as it is already threatened by the the actions of the liberal minister. I mean, the whole part of it is seen in Tijans' view as different aspects of decline. You have to remember he he does hold strong reactionary tendencies, and so even the attempts of the anti suffragettes I mean, he's golfing with one Sandbach, uh, an MP and Waterhouse, and then there's bumbling local police officers, which in the book, I can even get at the odd bribe so as not to look for them, is in and of itself uh, folly and whimsical. You know, there's there's this absurdity to it. Sandbach calls them wild women and, and believes they just need to be tamed. As Tijans does notice that at least in one Valentine one up, there's a genuine spirit and a genuine vision. In fact, more so of a, a spirit that he admires than he sees in the anti-suffragettes uh, of Sandbach and to a certain extent uh, General Campion who is sort of his mentor, he's his godfather uh, we'll, we'll come back to Campion, his best moments will shine in later episodes when he's involved in the war effort at a high level but even this idea that you know here in 1911 it happens at a golf course at this sort of leisurely affair is meant to illustrate a, a level of decadence amongst uh, Campion, Sandbach and even to a certain extent Tijans because he indulges McMaster too much perhaps that's his sentimentalism that's another aspect of Tijans' character uh, he was 
not he's, he's only a half brother with mark his elder brother mark at this point is heir to groby now groby is this large estate in yorkshire as well you have to understand that these are north men uh something pure uh, a pure sense of england comes to the yorkshire landowner than the south the south being of course in teachings eye far more corrupt but Tejans is seen to be soft, especially in Mark's view, because Tejans comes from a second marriage of his of their father, uh, to to somebody who was from the South Riding of Yorkshire, which their estates being in the North North Yorkshire is seen to be effectively non Yorkshire. That that she brought him up soft, and these these weaknesses were passed on to Christopher. His soft touch, his sentimentality. And his sentimentality for McMaster has sort of led him to be in this uh, decadent situation of the golf course with the leisure. His sentimentality will, of course, in the views of those who believe his own son is not his, and that's never particularly landed one way or the other. That's meant the reader is meant to make his own mind up on whose son it is. It flip flops at some, but his bringing up of the son is seen to be a sentimentality, of course. And his scenes with his son is meant to be too soft for the fatherly figure, especially in the eyes of people like Mark Tejans. That's an, so that's just another aspect of Christopher's character you have to contend with. Father sent word. He sent me. And my mother? Mother soft, brought you up soft. Not your fault. Second wife, late child, no Yorkshireman. Bad combination. My mother is Yorkshire. Oh, south riding by a whisker. And at the golf uh, course, there is this scene where they see these two city folk uh, engaging in low-level conversation. And again, it's in relation to their affairs and whatnot. Um, and McMaster realizes that true teachings is discussed, and even Campion's discussed. Remember, Campion is an old Tory, but less reactionary than Christopher. He is still going along with the protocol all the way until the end of the empire, so to speak. Uh, but McMaster realizes that for the Tories, at least, this really was the end of the world, the last of England. And so you get that explicitly stated in the in the golf club scene. That their world, by letting the vulgar members into the club, that the world is collapsing. So just little trickles before, of course, the Great War looming. Uh, and even then, you know, you see that, that sense of collapse and the fact that Tejans is overcome by Waterhouse. The liberal is overcoming the reactionary Tory, uh, where Waterhouse literally congratulates Tejans and says we couldn't get the bill before the house till next session without your figures um, and Ford gives us the literal wordings Mr. Water has overwhelmed Tejans uh, he's stupefied by him in a certain sense the power is with the liberal the power is with Waterhouse at this moment 1911 and so then after the golf scene we get the this is the chronology of the episode of episode one we get the scene where we're shown to uh, Sylvia Tejans in Germany. And this is uh, chapter two in Ford Maddock Ford's book. And we're introduced to three characters. Uh, Sylvia Tejans, nay, Satterthwaite, her mother, Mrs. Satterthwaite. And because this is a Catholic family, their priest, the family priest, uh, one father, Consett, who was Irish. Again, he can symbolize through the the Catholic divide of the Tejans relationship, Sylvia Tejans, Christopher Tejans relationship, he can symbolize the, the Irish split that is coming again in the Great War from uh, the United Kingdom. In fact, he's, Father Concert is literally told to be smuggling or, or in, at this point in cahoots with the Germans about smuggling arms into Ireland. And it's in this scene that we get you know, Sylvia's determination, she'll go back to Christopher and torment him. That's going to be her raison d'etre, uh, and that'll be the raison d'etre throughout the entire book. I can torment that man. So let's look at uh, Mrs. Satterthwaite. Mrs. Satterthwaite is described as this uh, by Ford. Mrs. Satterthwaite was extremely indifferent to her surroundings, but she insisted on having a piece of furniture for her papers. She liked also to have a profusion of hothouse, not garden flowers, but as there were none of these... At Lobscheid, their German retreat, she did without them. She insisted also as a rule on a comfortable chaise long, which is rarely if ever used, but the German Empire of those days did not contain a comfortable chair, so she did without it, lying down on her bed when she was really tired. Ford wants to give us a scene in 
Germany because he wants to establish the other side of the war effort. Um, uh, but Satithwaite, Mrs. Satithwaite, of course, is kind of indifferent to this. She just wants to set up her, her child well in the old sense. The, her Catholicism is not the Catholicism really as seen by the flights in uh, Evelyn Wall's Bride, Bride's Head Revisited. It's much more lapsed. She just just up and coming and trying to put her daughter in a situation where she can rise through the ranks of the aristocracy. And then Consett has to come to terms with this as, as the family priest. In his view, the whole marriage is void because she married a Protestant. He wants, but he wants Tejans, Christopher, to divorce so that Sylvia can begin to live a clean life. So the Catholicism of Sylvia Tejans, as she experiences it, is one in which she believes that she can be as almost as sinful as she likes, and there will be this moment of repentance. And of course, her um, her great show i.e. Sh the showing of herself to the world in a sort of audacious manner is meant to be symbolic of of the grand shows of, of the Catholic cathedrals and the masses and so on. The interior of those places of worship juxtaposed against the more austere Protestant churches, which of course is much more uh, Christopher Teachings' outlook on the world. But she also look, expects sort of a late repentance. Her sins can always be forgiven, which again is a much more uh, Catholic outlook than Tejans, who has to live his virtue constantly. It's not. It's going to be a moment of redemption. Uh, but Constant, nonetheless, represents a bit more fire and brimstone. I mean, Sylvia Tejans has those Catholic elements to her, but also has the decadent. Uh, upper class, idle, girl type women, social status of 1911, particularly in the upper classes. Consit only has the Catholicism, you know, and, and, and particular Irish brand of it. Uh, Consit literally saying, if the woman as the church directs would have children by her husband and live decent, she would have no such feelings. Feelings of hatred towards teachings, that is. It's unnatural living and unnatural practices that cause these complexes. Don't think I'm an ignoramus priest if I am. And then there's this whole idea, but uh, Mrs. Satterthwaite just wants to put up with the illusion that her daughter is rising, says, but Sylvia has had a child. But of course, concert bites back. It was that blackguard's Drake, wasn't it? Um, and there's this little difference here where he sa Constant says, I, I thank God that I am not your spiritual advisor, but only your friend in God. Uh, for if I had to answer your question, I could answer it only one way. Uh, this is about whether she was uh, Sylvia's hell bound or not. I mean, there's a sense of superstition still to Constant, but he's more intelligent. He... He's superstition because, say, for instance, in the scene in Germany, he believes that they're in this old pagan part of the world, last place to be converted to Catholicism. And he has his little relics and trinkets in his own way. But he is m at least a consistent, a man consistent with his own view of the world. And in a weird sense, Tejans respects that, even though for Tejans it's much more it's inner morality, his behavior to society that is the parade, with concert. It's the church's direction and that the idea that when you move away from the church's direction and the church's teachings, you are exposing yourself to the devil at work. That's the concert view. You just have to bear that in mind as something separate to the teachings view. I'll settle down by his side and I'll be chaste. I've made up my mind to it. I'll be bored stiff for the rest of my life. Except for one thing, I can torment that man and I'll do it. For all the times he's tormented me. <laughs> and then we have the second, so that's scene, you know, our first big scene, the golf scene. And our Sylvia and the Satterthwaite scene. Which establishes the Satterthwaite vision, the Catholic vision. That'll, that'll go against the, the teaching's vision. Then we have Breakfast at Dushman's. The interior setting. 
Uh, Breakfast.Dushimans is going to show, it's going to flesh out a little bit more things we've already discussed with the McMaster. That Mrs. Dushiman, he's leaning towards having an affair with her. She's his muse, his pre raphaelite muse in a certain sense. And the Mr. Dushiman of the famed Breakfast of Dushiman, a sort of old uh, reverend who they knew at Cambridge. Tejant is, of course, a Cambridge man, uh, hence this illusion to soft, right? Cambridge rears the softer side. Bailey Oxford is the stronger side of these imperial administrators. But at Cambridge, they had this old Latinist teacher, one Mr. Dushiman, Reverend Dushiman. And there's a sense that Dushiman is meant to represent a post-lit and straitchy view, and Ford is writing in a post-lit and straitchy world in the 1920s, like Lit and Straitchy's eminent Victorians coming out in the 1910s, I believe 1916 or something like this. Um, Mr. Dushiman, as reverend of the university, the old Latinist, is a caricature of the Dr. Thomas Arnold of rugby, this rugby and ideal, which I've talked about in my, uh, my series on morality in England. Gone wrong, though. He's a caricature of the whole of the whole vision. Um, his asceticism uh, leading to self-starvation practices leading to hallucinations and, and his losing of his own mind. That's what occurs to Mr. Dushiman. And the whole setting is, is Ford just giving us a wonderful scene where all of the characters have already said, Valentine Wannup, idealist, idealistic uh, suffragette, now sort of semi-hiding from the police, though her uh, com companion in the crime, the golf course, one Gertie, is in trouble with the Metropolitan Police previously. She's, she's in a worse situation than Wannup. And they have to sort of smuggle back themselves back separately. We've got Wanup, we've got Christopher Tejans, we've got uh, McMaster and his muse. We've even got uh, Mrs. Wanup, the writer that Tejans respects, uh, show up. So get all these characters together and have them have to behave around the, the aesthetic bewilderment of Mr. Dushiman. And that is breakfast, this vision of the reverend being able to bring together enlightened people around the table uh, and talk Latin or talk about high poetry, you know, a little bit of the sense of Britain's place in the world culturally is collapsing. I mean, the, 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 the he barely knows where he is. He sees the devil in, in everyone. A sort of Biel, Beelzebub uh, is before me in the presence. Either that or it's that, you know, he believes Tejans and McMaster are, are doctors coming away to uh, certify him for lunacy. And so that's the end of the, the, the rugby and ideal. Here's Ford Maddox Ford's description of Mr. Dushiman on page 93 of the Penguin uh, Classic Edition. Mr. Dushiman was extremely tall, with a slight stoop of the proper clerical type. His face was of alabaster. His grey hair, parted in the middle, fell brilliantly on his high brows. His glance was quick, penetrating, austere his nose very hooked and chiselled. He was the exact man to adorn a lofty and gorgeous fane, as Mrs. Dushiman was the exact woman to consecrate an Episcopal drawing room. With his great wealth, scholarship, and tradition, why then, went through McMaster's mind in a swift pinprick of suspicion, isn't he at least a dean? And of course the reason is because he's going insane. Uh, Ford says, you know, there's a threatening manner to, to, to his insanity, which is, of course, the th threatening manner of the, the, ins the ensuing insanity of, uh, of the rugby and ideal in this 1911 world. And Ford says that there is an ex expression of cunning singular on the ascetic features of Mr. Dushman, which unnerves McMaster and even unnerves Tejans to a certain degree. Though while McMaster is struggling with Mr. Dushman, uh, in a dialogue, it's interesting to know that Tejans has already pivoted to the suffragette, uh, Wanup, who's, who's taken his interest. And that's the that's the the interesting point about the breakfast that Dushiman's seen is that McMaster, until now, has been the up-and-comer. Think about his role in the Imperial Department of Statistics. In his love of the pre-Raphaelites, Rossetti in particular, his monograph, he shows himself to be revealed as a certain nostalgist. Inaccurate at, at times, but a nostalgist nonetheless. But he thinks himself modern. 
Tegens, who thinks himself as the reactionary, at this point is more drawn towards Valentine Wan of the suffragette. So despite his reactionary tendencies, his love for the uh, authentic character draws him towards Wanup and draws him towards the future. And that really sets us up towards the third scene, the third and final scene of this first episode, which is the journey home, where finally we peel away McMaster and Mrs. Dushiman and all of the secondary characters and just put Christopher and Valentine together on a court, uh, on a cart heading through a back road of Sussex. Of course, they're trying to evade the police. That's the pretense which leads to the scene. And the final scene uh, where McMaster parts with Tijans, this is on page 102, before the before Tijans sets off with McMaster alone, says this. McMaster went down the tall steps to the car that gleamed in the summer sun. The roses shone of the supremely leveled turf. His heel met the stones with the hard tread of a conqueror. He could have shouted aloud. And this is, McMaster thinks, through the breakfast of Dushman scene, that he's overcome Mr. Dushman, he's overcome the old rugby and ideal, and he can have the affair, of course, with Miss, Mrs. Dushman as muse uh, going forward. He steps into the car, he is the conqueror. Tijans then retreats to the back country of England with Valentine Wanup. Later on the same page, new chapter. This, Tijans thought, is England. A man and a maid walk through Kentish grass fields, the grass ripe for the scythe. He of good birth, she birth quite as good. Each knew the names of the birds that piped and grass that bowed. Chaffinch, Greenfinch, Yellow Ammer, not my dear Hammer. Ammer, from the Middle High German, not Finch. This is again teaching his particularness, we're inside his mind here. A garden Warbler, Dartford Warbler, Pied Wagtail, known as Dishwasher. So he knows the land with a strange sense of connection, and, and that's the another point of the a Catholic Protestant split that you have in the Tejans relationship. Despite Tejans coming over with, quote, King William, you know, 1688 and all that, he is has a strange connection to the land in, in his noblesse oblige and his tendencies. There's this great tree outside Groby, pagan tree, it symbolizes the paganism. And he is a, he's in love with the tree more than the house itself. The land of England speaks to him in ways it doesn't with to Sylvia uh, or any of the the, the Satterthwaites at all. God's England, Tijans exclaimed to himself in high good humour, land of hope and glory, F natural, descending to tonic, C major, chord of 6-4, suspension of the dominant 7th to the core, common chord of C major. Absolutely correct. Across the country came the sound of bugles that his father knew. And of course, Tijan's tread, all of this is great with horses rather than the motor car. The motor car and the, or the motor plow or anything motorized is for him an aberration, but he knows it's coming. Yet still, his soft sentimentality, he goes back to the horse, back to the 18th century. And of course, as they're going back through the Sussex fields, or perhaps it's into Kent at this point, um, you know, Valentine matches him intellectually, uh, talking about talking about certain history to certain landmarks they pass, and also to about certain moralities. I mean, there's a point here where Miss Wanup says, and, and you also have to remember. Wanup is representative of purity and chastity. And she has to overcome her own parade around chastity. That's her parade that has to end uh, when she realizes that uh, that uh, life with teachings is, is likely worth it. But at this point, she's still vowing intellectually with them and seeing if they are uh, of intellectual equals. Miss Wanup, have your chastity impugned then? What do you speak to strange men in public for? You know you can't do it in this country. If it were a decent straight land like Ireland, where people cut each other's throats for clean issues, papers versus prod, for instance, well, you could. Every man you met, as long as he wasn't an Englishman of good birth, that would deflower you. And of course, she is afraid of the horse. 
<laughs> literally says, no, I'm afraid of horses. I can drive any sort of car, but I am afraid of horses when Tijans has to has to tame the horse and startle. You should know, Miss Wanna, we are being talked about. I will teach you not to speak to strange men on golf courses. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. You'll live it down. The only thing that matters is to do good work. It's true. I wouldn't care what those swines say about me, but I do. I care about what they say about you. It was the lark, the herald of the morn, the nightingale. Believe me, love, it was the nightingale. There, he sounds hoarse now. The song changes in June. But of course, Christopher doesn't go through with the temptations he has to kiss Valentine or have any sort of affair with Valentine here because he's believing that, uh, you know, this is straight from the book, if it's sexual sins, God punishes, teaching his own mind. He is indeed just and inscrutable because he had had physical contact with this woman before he married her, this Sylvia Satterthwaite, in a railway carriage coming down from Dejukeries. An extravagantly beautiful girl, and he's paid the price for that the rest of his life. He, she was irresistible, reclining back as the shires rushed past. The next crossroads is Grandfather's Wantways. An old gentleman used to sit there called Grandfather Finn. Every tender and market day, he sold fleet cakes from a basket to the carts going by. Tender and market was abolished in 1845, done by the repeal of the Corn Laws. Why do you suppose I make a collection of obsolescent facts? Because you do. You make tourism out of them. I thought your type were all in museums. You want to be an English country gentleman spinning principles out of quaintness and letting the country go to hell. You won't stir a finger except to say I told you so. And of course his belief that he's being punished for that um, means that he doesn't have any, any relationship with Valentine at this moment. And then they bumped into what, of course, the motor car plows into them uh, in the Sussex mist. Uh, and it's, of course, General Campion who's down by Sussex. This is pre-established. He's down, actually, I believe they're in Kent at this point because he's down meant to be heading towards Dover for ceremonial duties. And Campion, of course, believes that... Uh, I wish you'd make some noise. He again, John Peel, with his coat so grey. He again, John Peel, at the break of day. What are you doing? Trying the other side. Where are you? He again, John Peel. We're nearly home. I found a milestone. We're just above Mountby. You can go on now. Walk around. The Mountby Drive is 100 yards. Just pull to the left or the horse will walk straight up to the house. And look, the sun. It's the beginning of the longest day, the summer solstice. Sisteri and soul, because the sun seems to stand still.
the Tijans plays out with the parade. This is still episode one. He has to almost in some sense pretend he is having the affair as to save Sylvia's image and therefore in his own mind at this point save the marriage because the scene is more acceptable if Christopher is the one putting the strain on the marriage rather than Sylvia. Of course it's the other way around. We know that as the audience but Campion uh, Campion is kind of foolish. In the TV adaptation Campion is General Campion, Godfather of the Tijans, rep- meant to represent the more Tory by instinct rather than ideal sort of man is a bit too much of a bumbling idiot. Uh, he's obscured. He 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 is obscured by Sylvia's devilry uh, in the book as well. But there are other moments in the book, particularly the army scenes later, where he really shines uh, as having a good view of the world geopolitically in that war war setting. But on the home front, yes, he is obscured, um, particularly by, by Sylvia. But what then does Tijans take away from his ride home with, with Wanup? He is, of course, has become enamoured with her. She was as good as a man, a South Country man. This is, again, intellectually. He's, he'd never come across uh, a woman that could spar with him on the intellectual manner. She corrects him on Ovid. Um, she, she knows the history of the land to a degree that he finds matching. She was ready to acknowledge the superior woodenness of the North. That was their convention. So he did not call down, I hope you're all right, though he had desired to. Uh, and they have discussions about the pronunciation of correct Latin words and who has the right of it. Tijans, of course, wants to follow the German model um, because it is correct. But Wanup likes the you know the, the view done from Oxford and Cambridge tr- traditionally. Again, that's a you know difference. Tijans has his ideal of the 18th century, but he's he also has his ideal of what is correct. That's why he works in the de- Imperial Department of Statistics, after all. Uh, you know, where Caesar is Kaiser and so on. And they have this little Latin debate. But the importance is that Wanup kind of knows he's correct in a certain manner, but she herself is the daughter of a deceased Latinist. And she's right for her own reasons of English nostalgic sentiment, which Tijans finds agreeable. But he overcomes the impulse uh, to have a kiss with her. Why? Because he's still at this point the man of the parade. And um, book one, some do not. Ends, uh, part one ends with Tijans mulling over the idea of principles. Principles are like a skeleton map of a country. You know whether you're going east or north. And so he obeys the principles and carries on with the parade. Until next time. Tell me about Groby. It's older than Protestantism. Groby Great Tree is the symbol of the Yorkshire Tisians. The big cedar. The crown darkens our topmost windows and the roots undermine our foundations. So one of them will have to go. How so a tree one day. Take you there. My dear, never take me to Groby. It's the postmaster's boy. He can take you home.